So just when you think that palladium has snuck off in the distance and away, away it's went, well, palladium's going to come back for a second round. And in this round, we're going to be talking about the heck reaction, which also involves palladium. Okay, now the reason I say it that way, it's because a lot of people think that they're going to have to keep the heck reaction separate from the Suzuki reaction. And both of these involve a halide and both of these involve palladium. However, there's a big difference between the two. So this should be very easy. Very, very easy to distinguish the difference between Suzuki and the heck. Why heck? Anybody can do it. Well, the reason that I say it this way is because with the Suzuki, we're going to have this boron containing group. With the heck reaction, we do not have a boron containing group, but we have all of the other mixes of the Suzuki reaction. We have the palladium that is present, and we also have the halide that is present. So what's different? Well, something has got to be in place of the boron. Something's got to be there. We have to have a reaction. A reaction is going to take two things. So what is that other piece? What is that other component? That is what makes heck different. However, when I say that, what you need to take away is that the reaction overall to make the product is very similar to the Suzuki. It's just a different way to get there. I, I mean, let's say we're here on the coast. So let's say that we want to take a trip to Raleigh one weekend. Okay, not a big deal. There's tons of ways to get there. And Suzuki and heck is kind of like taking the interstate. And then if you don't want to do that option, you can take some of the back roads. But you're going to end up with the same place. You're going to end up with a very similar product in the very end. That's why both of these are palladium-based compounds. Both of these are palladium coupling reactions. Both of these are talked about together as a whole in one lump sum, even in your textbook if you're reading it and following along. They're going to address both of them at one time. So let's talk a little bit more details about the heck reaction. You want to? I think so. I mean, that's why you're taking the class. All right. So we know we have to have a halogen. Typically going to be bromine, but we know it's got to be there. And we also know that this is palladium-based, so palladium coupling reaction is going to go forward. And just like with Suzuki, we need some type of base here as well. Okay, not a big deal there. Everything is kind of similar so far. No surprises. We're going to get a product. This product is going to couple two carbons together. So it's still going to undergo a chain elongation. Just another way that we can do this. That's all that this has been about. So in order for the heck to go forward, we're going to take our halogen and we have to bring in some type of carbon-carbon double bond. Now off of this can be whatever it wants to be and that's just the way I'm going to write it. That R could have been on the left or the right, it doesn't matter. But it's an alkene. And these alkene reactions with palladium will react with these halogenated alkenes and they will form a coupling reaction that will couple two carbons together. Now, once again, very much like Suzuki, and you would be very happy, we do have a mechanism 
The details of the mechanism, again, is not fully understood, so we're not going to require you to memorize that awful mechanism. Number two, just like with Suzuki, it is a cyclic mechanism. So as you saw before in that big, huge, lumpy circle with all of those different steps and the fancy words that came along with it, we can do the same thing for the heck, but once again, we're not really going to focus on that. The other thing that I need to mention with the heck is that here we do sometimes have to look for steric hindrance. And we also want to look for what we call electron withdrawing groups. And both of these we addressed in Chemistry 251. I mean, there's no surprises here either, right? We know what electron withdrawing groups are. They're the <laughs> suckers. The steric hindrance, that means they're just too big and, and fat and large and they can't move around and they take up room on each other. I mean, it's like, you know, going in, into a housing subdivision where all the houses are basically built on top of each other. Uh, nobody enjoys that. So organic is 3D world. And that's the way that some of these reactions are. That's the way we have to think of these. And heck is one of those. But what you're going to find out is that we're going to quickly kind of bypass this. I mean, it's good to mention and say, hey, hey uh, remember <laughs> back in the day, 251, hint, hint, hint. But when they give us these reactions, folks, uh, they keep them very simple, to tell you the truth. And they're not going to try to trick you up too much. Now, I mentioned the mechanism. Here you go. Uh, yeah. Imagine if I told you to go and memorize that and regurgitate it blah, back out onto a sheet of paper. No, it's not going to happen. But we can follow through this circle mechanism just to kind of get an idea of what goes on. So let me kind of tell you Tracy term and then let me kind of go through the more proper description. So here is our palladium catalyst. Notice there's two L's, one there and one there. So very similar to what we saw with Suzuki. And then this palladium is going to come in with some type of halogenated compound. And again, they work the best with Vinlic or Aryl halides. And that's something that we've not really went away from. Vinlic and Aryl are going to work the best. So the palladium squeezes in between the carbon and the bromine, just like magnesium did, just like some of those other metals did, like copper, right? No surprises there. And then we're going to bring in something that has a double bond. And right here is the double bond that we're interested in. It's not this one. That double bond is not what we're interested in. That's a double bond O. Okay, that's a carbonyl group, and in particular an ester group that is right here. So this double bond characteristic will kind of gravitate toward that palladium. And, and the one of the reasons is... This palladium right now is at zero, if you take a look at that formal charge, and then here it becomes positive, so there's a positive area right there. And this double bond is a negative area. So this double bond molecule comes in, right, and it kind of sits over top of that palladium. And that palladium's positive, and that double bond's negative, and they go hubba hubba, yeah, yeah, and then bing, bing, break, break. And they form this kind of intermediate where you see the palladium. That palladium still has the bromine on it. That palladium now has made room for that carbon that was involved in one of those double bonds or that double bond that we focused on. And that's the connector piece. That connector piece is right there. Well, the palladium is going to have to leave at some point in time. So this palladium goes, wee! bye-bye and when that happens those electrons have to go somewhere and those electrons go back to that double bond which is how they were anyway to begin with and then we end up with this product so what we've done here is that we have taken one piece of a reagent that's basically this with the bromine removed and we've glued it together to this whole thing, right? I mean, look at that. There's the double bond. 
there's the carbon, carbon double bond O with an OCH3. And then in the meantime, palladium goes back, it regenerates itself, spits out a little bit of acid, but it regenerates itself and it goes back to the starting point. And that is the definition of a catalyst. So very similar to the Suzuki as far as cyclic kind of mechanisms go, and it kind of all happens at one time. The bonds break, the bonds get glued back together, the bonds form, and it all happens at once. Now, if you look down here at L, you know, PDLL, uh, remember what I told you. The L could stand for a number of different things, but folks, here is triphenylphosphine. There is my phosphorus, and then off of this phosphorus, I have three groups, tri, and they are all benzene-type rings, and that's where the term phenyl comes from, or pH. Now, if you really want it to be descriptive, let's be formal, let's be smart, let's use our organic words. Okay, so step A, let's start here first. Step A is a oxidative addition where the palladium will insert itself into this aryl ring and the bromide bond. Palladium will then form what we call a pi complex with the alkene, and that's kind of down here at the very bottom. And then in this step B, the alkene will insert itself into the palladium carbon bond in what we call a syn addition step. All right, then we've got some torsional strain that goes on. We ensure that this bond ends up being trans when that double bond forms because the torsional strain has to relieve that rotation and we have to end up with a trans isomer. It's more stable. We get a beta elimination step that happens here as well. And that will form the new palladium alkene pi complex, if that's what you want to call it. And then that will go and uh, regenerate the catalyst through what we call a reductive elimination. A lot of fancy terms, a lot of fancy words. If that's the way that I taught this class, no one would enjoy it. So instead, I like the sound effects of wee, and then it just kind of sits onto this bond, and the bonds break, right? So that's the way that I approach organic, because it could be a very dry, boring class if I didn't. Now, let's take a look at some example problems. All right, so example problems, here we go. I'll show you how easy, I'll show you how easy. I've never done anything easier in my life. All right, so here's benzene, or with a bromine on it. And then let's react this thing with just a simple CH2 double bond CH2. And then on the arrow, I'm going to put palladium. And I can write L2 here if I want to, but you know what I mean by this. We'll put palladium there. And then I down here at the bottom... I can also put uh, some type of base, and this base, I can just write the word base, or they do use a specific type of base here. It seems like it works the best, and they often will use it in the reactions, and this is going to be a CH3, a CH2, and then a 3, and a nitrogen. So triethylamine, tri because there's three of them, ethyl, because there's a two-carbon base, and it is an amine group. So triethylamine is going to be the typical solvent that they will use for this palladium-based reaction that we're calling the HEC. All right, so the HEC reaction goes forward. What do we do? All right, well, think about that crazy, awful-looking mechanism that you just saw. All right, this is how we solve these problems. I'm going to redraw my reagent that has the halogen. There it goes. And then I'm going to take my eraser and I'm going to go. Doo -doo 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 -doo. There it goes. It goes away. And then this whole thing where the double bond is at, boing, goes on. That's it. That's all, that, that's all that the heck reaction does. Well, heck, I thought it was going to be much harder than this. No, it's not. 
It's a simple substitution reaction. That's the way that you can think about this. It's a substitution reaction where this alkene is coming into the pitcher and it is replacing the halogen that is on that, in this case, a ring structure. Notice there's one halogen missing, or hydrogen. This hydrogen has to go away so we can open up a bond over here to the left-hand side of it. Otherwise, that carbon is going to have five bonds. It can't have five. It needs four. One to the hydrogen, one to the ring, and two for the double bond. The double bond does not get attacked. The double bond does not break down. And folks, we have elongated a chain, but we've kept the integrity of the double bond when we did it as well. Very, very nice. Very, very nice setup as far as elongating a molecule and not really doing too much else when it comes to the functional groups. This is also why we often say that the Heck reaction involves a beta elimination because it is one of these hydrogens that goes away. It gets eliminated. It has to get eliminated. We have to make room for that. That carbon, again, can only have four bonds. That's it. That's all. That's all that the Heck reaction is. Again, very similar to Suzuki. Okay, well, what's the difference? Have you already forgotten it? I hope not. We just talked about it. But if you go back and look at Suzuki, what you would see is that there would be a bond here to a boron-containing species. And whatever was right here, that is what went on in its place. It was a very similar kind of thought process here. But the Heck reaction does not require a boron reagent. That's why that's called Suzuki, and that's why this is called the heck. Again, two ways to get there. We're not saying one way is better than the other. Both of them get to where you're going. It's just a matter of which one do you prefer. So let's take a look at another example. We're going to take this compound with the iodine on it, and then let's react it with something that looks like this. Palladium. And then let's keep the triethyl amine group. And the question is going to say, predict the product. Okay. It's not a big deal. The, the last one... If you remember, we had that benzene ring with a bromo on it. This was an aryl group. So, cheek, cheek, that works for Suzuki. That works for Heck. So, that's a very good thing. Here, well, that iodine is on an sp2 carbon, a carbon with a double bond. So, cheek, cheek, that works as well. That's good news, right? That's one of the things that we do really want to see with Heck and Suzuki. We want to see a Venlic or an aryl halide. And in both of these cases, we had them. All right, the second component for the heck was just a double bond. Do we have it? Uh-huh, yeah, we do. It's right here. Okay, I see that double bond. All right, so this is how the heck works. I'm going to take this piece, and I always redraw that uh, halogen reagent, and then get rid of it. And this particular carbon, that double bond's at the end. So this carbon was connected to an iodine, but this carbon is now going to be connected to that new carbon from that bond. That's where it's going to go, right there. So that carbon still keeps the double bond. That's on a carbon that goes down. That carbon still has the double bond to the O, and then that goes up to the other oxygen, which still has the methyl group. You just coupled the two things together. You played matchmaker. You ever watch that show, Million Dollar Matchmaker? I mean, why can't I be a contestant on that? A million dollars. Yeah, matchmaker. So you have just joined two carbon pieces together. 
you have elongated a chain. You have made a bigger, more complicated molecule. And again, that's very good sometimes, depending on what we need to do in the lab. If you can imagine working in a pharmaceutical industry, and you're in a laboratory, and it's your job to synthesize a new, maybe active pharmaceutical ingredient that we call an API. Okay, well, a lot of times you take something that's already there, and you modify it, you change it, you make it better, you create a new drug. So chain elongation is not a rare circumstance in a laboratory. Just one of the reasons why we would use it. All right, so let's go and take a look at some more examples. Just so you know that I'm not crazy, I want to prove to you how easy these things are meant to be. And I hope you're looking at this and saying, phew, thank goodness it's not harder than this. I mean, I was expecting something horrible. Well, in time, but not right now. All right, so there we go. There's your ingredients for the heck. It's not a Suzuki. How do I know? Well, that's because I don't see a boron. Do you see a boron on here anywhere? Nope, I don't. I see the halogen here. The halogen is on a ring, so that is the aryl halide that we're after. So the other reagent, there's no boron there. There's no boron there. That means that this cannot be Suzuki because I see the palladium. This has to be the heck. Okay, so we've got that taken care of. What do I do? Okay, well, you start off redrawing, surprise, the reagent that has the halogen. So there it is. Then you're going to take your little eraser, and you're going to make that noise. There it goes. And then this carbon double bond carbon goes on in its place. That's it. That's all that you're supposed to do. That's really what Suzuki did too. It took whatever that piece was on the boron and it just slapped it onto the place of the alkane or the halogen, right? That's all it did. It connected the two alkanes or an alkene and an alkyne, whatever the case was, it connected those carbons together. Well, if I wanted to be proper, I can put two hydrogens there, whatever, I'll do it. I'll put a hydrogen there too, just so you know it's there. But we understand that they're supposed to be there, which is why very often I'll leave them off. Okay, well, there's the another example of heck. Let's do another one. I mean, we're on a roll. Again, I'm trying to show you how easy this is. I mean, I don't even think you have to study for this stuff, right? I mean, compared to what you really did before, goodness gracious. I mean, this is like a, a walk in the park. All right. So we're going to take these two reagents. And we're going to react them with palladium and triethylamine. We want to know what happens. So you're going to look at this. Oh, wait a minute. I think he's trying to give me a trick question. The reason I think he's trying to give me a trick question is because I don't see a halogen on here. Do you? I don't see a halogen. Do I see a, an F or a CL or a BR or an I? No, I don't see any of those. So my gut instinct is going to tell me no reaction. This is not a heck. We've not seen this before. Well, this is why I'm giving this to you because there's always more to the story, right? There's always more to that story than what we're really giving you. I, we've got to stop it at some point. If not, we'd be here forever talking about organometallics for years to come. But one of the things that I do want to introduce you to is something that we call an aryl triphylate. All right, so that's what this OTF is. This is regarded just like a halogen, meaning I treat that group just like I would treat a bromo group if it was present. It's a very good leaving group. It is another option that we have in the world of organic. We've not really talked about this yet. 
after all the times that we've talked about halogens, well, this particular group on an aryl is a very good leaving group. So if they are trying to trick you, this is one of the ways that they will do it. They will not give you a halogen because they think it's too easy now at this point. And they will try to switch it up with maybe this OTF. And I want you to treat that OTF just like a normal leaving group would. There is no difference in it. All right, and there's its proper name right on the screen for you if you want to look it up and know more about it, but I don't think you need to go that far. All right, so this is how we handle this. I'm going to take my reagent that had that group, OTF, and I'm going to say OMG. Only thing I've got to do is, there we go. So, this carbon that's right there at the end, that's the one that it's going to connect to. That's the easiest accessible to it because of steric hindrance. That's why we talked about that. So this was connected to OTF, but now it's going to be connected to that carbon, and that carbon now has a double bond on it, and then that's to another carbon, and that kind of goes down, and then that connects to this other ring structure that we see there. There you go, folks. That's all that there is to it. You treat it just like all before. If I wanted to put a ring here, not a big deal. I would put a ring there on my product. It works out the same way. Okay? If there was another group on this, like a CH3 group, this reaction would work the same way. You just put a CH3 group that's right there. If this had maybe a CH2, CH3 group, an ethyl group here at the bottom, guess what? It's CH2, CH3 down here at the bottom. That doesn't get changed. It doesn't get affected. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. What's happening is that this carbon, which is negative, is getting attracted to that carbon, which is going to be slightly positive. We can show some arrows, but it's not really proper. And the reason is because you know what that heck mechanism is supposed to look like. And then we can kind of poop off goes that. Notice we didn't do anything with the palladium. That's why this is not a prim and proper mechanism. But you could think of it this way if that's what you want it to do. So just an FYI, this is a very, very simplified version of what goes on in these uh, mechanisms between an alkene and this molecule that maybe has a good halogen on it or leaving group mixed with a little bit of palladium. All right. So I don't think that was any more difficult than some of the others that we've had. Do you? No, I don't. So let's take a look at another example. And here we go. So example A and example B says, here's you a molecule. This molecule has a halogen. And we're going to react that with something that has a double bond. There it is. Carbon, carbon, double bond. Uh, we mix that with palladium and triethylamine, and we want to know what products form. And that's where I'm going to stop this video, because I think at this point right now, you can answer this question without a problem. So try it. Do not give up on me. Pause the video. Stop the video. Write down these examples. Try to predict the products. See what you get. And then in the next video, push play and double check your answers. I guarantee you, I hope that you'll get it right. Only thing you have to do, find where that carbon double bond is, find where the bromine is, and play matchmaker. I just hope that you can make a million dollars in doing it. Million dollar matchmaker. Episode number two coming up after this one.